If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. I mentioned it uh, before Mike Scott's newscast in our previous discussion on COVID. We, we've gone from two weeks to stop the spread and everything the public health professionals were wrong about over the last three years to the declaration from Dr. Ashish Jha, former dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University, now Fauci 2.0, that they can eliminate all COVID deaths. So I know, what, it, it, in case you God. thought their error rate would have engendered some humility, uh, you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. And they're worried this morning that, you know, Twitter has gotten rid of COVID misinformation and there's 11,000 plus people that, you know, they took off Twitter. They're worried now that these people are going to lead to less vaccinations because misinformation about COVID and the vaccinations are now allowed on Twitter. Yeah, well, the um, the vaccine zeitgeist dissipated well before Elon Musk took over Twitter as evidenced by the percentage of Americans who are lining up for the bivalent booster. I've lost count of where we're at, but I know, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, Becerra, the HHS secretary, is telling people over 50 on Twitter, ironically, every two months. Mm Mm-hmm. For more on this, pleased to be joined by Dr. Joel Zinberg, Competitive Enterprise Institute Senior Fellow and Director of Public Health and American Wellbeing Initiative at Paragon Health Institute. Dr. Zinberg, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Good morning. My pleasure. So um, Dr. Ashish Jha says follow orders and we'll, we'll, we'll do what uh, President Xi across the uh, uh, across the world in China says, which is we'll get to zero COVID, at least zero COVID deaths. Well, you know, he, he's very uh, upbeat and, you know, a real cheerleader. He announced a six-week sprint uh, to convince uh, Americans to get these new updated bivalent vaccines. Uh, the problem is, you know, no one wants them. Uh, the uh, the they were authorized at the end of August, and immediately the Biden administration announced it was going to buy 160 million, excuse me, 170 million doses. Um, and the fact is, since then, uh, roughly about 11, 12 percent of the population, and only about 15, 16 percent of the 227 million people who've completed the primary vaccine series and are eligible for the new booster have taken it since it was authorized. So, you know, you you can proceed as you like and, and sound like, you know, you're in a high school musical, but the fact is, unless you do something or you acknowledge why do people take vaccines, they're not going to take them. And this is just, you know, turning into a big waste of money. And now they're doubling down because they've decided they're going to take $475 million from a different COVID relief uh package a different you know for a different purpose and they're going to you know try to do this this sprint you know they're going to have something called can't wait a bunch of an ad campaign and this follows weeks and months of a different ad campaign called we can do this and why they think it's going to be any different now is sort of beyond me well do these doses expire at some point in time oh yeah they do expire and the fact is we know uh that between uh December, excuse me, December of 2020 and mid-May of 2022, the U.S. wasted over 82 million doses of the original vaccine, you know, because you have the government going out and buying it and and distributing it as opposed to allowing a market to work where, you know, there's there's a price system that sends signals to the suppliers and and from the uh, people who are demanding it. and, And you don't have that system at work now so it's just whatever you know some bureaucrat in washington thinks is the appropriate thing is what we're buying and it's it's kind of like the field of dreams if you buy it they will come 
Mm-hmm. But nobody's well, coming. If you buy it, pharma will continue to come, especially around election time. I wonder if that has anything to do with the uh, continuing uh, I don't to know. I think the, feather I think bed, this, Pfizer, Moderna. No, I, I think this is just a, a matter of the, you know, it's, it's not something confined to vaccine purchases. This is an administration that has a philosophy that they know yeah. better. Right. Than what than than anyone else, and particularly than the American people. So they're going to buy it, uh, and and hope that people come. But they're not going to come unless the people perceive a risk, which they don't now because COVID cases, ER visits, and hospitalizations peaked three months ago, and they've been down uh, since then. Deaths have been down even longer. They're not going to use the vaccine unless they perceive there's a benefit. And unfortunately, what's happened with the newer uh, viral variants is that there's little or no benefit in terms of I- interfering with in- infection and transmission from the vaccines. Uh, and, and they're not going to use vaccines when you've undermined public trust for the last few years by issuing confusing and contradictory messages. And, you know, just look at the CDC. I think they I think they need to be get uh, go back to being more imperious and less friendly, like Ashish Jha. More, you know, if it saves one life and if you don't follow orders, then you're killing grandma and grandpa. So tell 85 percent of the country now that's not uh, lining up for the bivalent booster that uh, they're going to kill grandma and grandpa. And, you know, maybe that'll get people in line. Well, the problem the problem is they can't say that with a straight face anymore. In other words, when the vaccine first came out, there was data indicating it interfered with transmission. So you could make the argument that you need to take the vaccine because when you take the vaccine, it keeps you from getting infected and passing it on to someone else. You can't make that argument anymore. You know, thankfully, the vaccines still appear to be effective in keeping you from getting seriously ill, but they don't keep you from getting infected and possibly passing it on to someone else. So do you think that since they purchased these, you know, millions of doses, is that why they're pushing this and having some mandates in certain school districts saying if you're not vaccinated or certain universities, if you're not vaccinated, you can't go to school? Well, look, those mandates have been in place for quite a while now, and they date back to the original vaccine. So I, I think they they have not, unfortunately, been keeping up with the science, as they like to say, uh, because the science has changed with the newer variants. The effectiveness in interfering with transmission is way down from where it was originally. So there's no you know, rationale anymore for these mandates. Are you telling us, are you trying to tell us that the hoi polloi knows more than our betters at Notre Dame or Yale? That can't be right. Well, look, the hoi, I would urge the hoi polloi, as you turn them, <laughs> to be vaccinated. It, it, it protects you, you know, from getting seriously ill and dying. But I feel very differently about the government mandating it or the government telling you you have to do it or the government wasting, you know, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars buying millions of vaccine doses that are going to be wasted and and these, you know, cute sounding ad campaigns. Well, what helped with their ad campaign is if there was, you know, an increase of cases after families gathered for Thanksgiving. I think they're foaming at the mouth. They want this to happen. Well, look, that's pretty cynical, but you might be right. <laughs> well, I, the the other thing, too, of uh, going back to Becerra, I mentioned his, uh, his the ad that he posted featuring uh, seniors mainly, pictures of seniors to go get their jabs. Uh, with the statistic, nine of 10 COVID deaths are people over the age of 50. Hmm. So now we have an acknowledgement uh, that we didn't have for years that COVID affects people in different age groups and, of course, associated underlying comorbidities differently. So they're not they're not making that concession, but it's it's embedded in that statistic they're banding about. Yeah, I mean, look, after after years of uh, criticizing and ostracizing the people who were behind, you know, the very highly respected people behind the Great Barrington Declaration, which propose what's called focus protection, focusing your efforts on the people who are most vulnerable, namely the elderly and people with underlying medical conditions. You know, they're finally kind of acknowledging what everyone else has known for for quite a while, that these are the folks who need uh, to get protected. And the best protection you can do for yourself is get vaccinated if you're in one of those groups. Something else I I read recently, uh, revelatory, 
This from the uh, Washington Post, speaking of our betters. Uh, story about uh, China and zero COVID. Quoting the Washington Post, a coronavirus outbreak on the verge of being China's biggest of the pandemic has exposed a critical flaw in Beijing's zero COVID strategy, a vast population without natural immunity. Oh. Mm-hmm. Wait a second. So, well, not, immu- just, not just wait, that vast population with no immunity, but the, the people who got vaccinated used the Sinovac vaccine, which is, you know, by many accounts, inferior to all the vaccines that came out in the West, particularly the mRNA vaccines, because they wanted for nationalist reasons to show that the Chinese vaccine was good. And in fact, it isn't. So not only do you not have the natural immunity, but you don't even the people who got vaccinated don't have their immunity. Well, but, but, wait, but I, thought, I didn't know natural immunity was a thing. Well, yeah. when, when did natural immunity become a thing? Well, look, I, I, you know, I, there are still people, unfortunately, who won't acknowledge that. But, uh, but you know, finally, I guess the Washington Post is coming around. And by the way, if if you want some, you know, I hope you guys are sitting down. But the Washington Post recently declared that COVID is no longer mainly a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Is that right? Really? <laughs> I missed correct. that headline. When was that? What was that well, declaration it, it, made? I have I have a link to that in my the piece I published in the uh, New York Post about these issues back uh, on November twenty fifth. You can go there and, and get the link, but it's really kind of hard to believe. But they finally come around, and and they were even telling the truth in, now and then. Wow! Yeah, that is that is a real breath of fresh air. Um, hmm. So so uh, just trying to get a sense of where we're at because here in Illinois. Um, we're still under an emergency order. We still have a, uh, a yep. COVID uh, five alarmer in Illinois, at least according to our governor. So, and and apparently uh, Joe Biden agrees because they're still doing the same deal at the federal level. So that's just for, that's just for cash and prizes. Uh, do we all acknowledge that now too? Well, no. I think you know part of the extension, uh, and and the administration has indicated they're going to extend the public health emergency up. Uh, it was originally uh, uh, going to expire in January. Now it's uh, slated to expire in April of 2023. Uh, you know, part of that is it, 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 there are all kinds of flexibilities and authorities that the government gains by keeping an emergency in place. Mm-hmm. And one of them, uh, an important one, if you if you're in a Biden administration and you want to expand government. Uh, run health care is that states cannot remove people who are ineligible from the Medicaid rolls as long as the public health emergency is in effect. Mm-hmm. So you've had over the, the last few years uh, about 15, 16 million people who are ineligible have accumulated on the rolls. You've seen an explosion in Medicaid coverage. Uh, once the pan- Once that emergency ends, uh, those folks, the states are going to have to go through the arduous task of, you know, redetermining who's eligible and who's not and, and taking these millions of people off the rolls. But if, if you're a go- person who thinks government run health care is the be all and end all, you don't want that to happen. Well, and here in Illinois, if you're a teacher and you get COVID and you're not at school, you can't get it counted as a sick day. It's free time off as long as there are emergency orders in place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and no, I mean, there's a consistency here that that these things will help you know extend government control over health care and this is something we ought to be very concerned about and unfortunately it's something that uh, you know I, I recently wrote uh, an article in national review talking about this how you know elections have consequences so now that you know the senate has remained uh in democratic hands the 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 most important figure in the Senate is going to be Bernie Sanders. And you know Bernie Sanders, who's been a big fan of Medicare for All, which is a complete takeover of the health system by the federal government. He's not going to – he's not interested in, in doing anything that's going to limit you know, the Medicaid expansion. Dr. Joel Zinberg, Competitive Enterprise Institute Senior Fellow and Director of the Public Health and American Wellbeing Initiative at Paragon Health Institute. Dr. Zinberg, thanks as always. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care, then. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. You're listening to Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer.